We are continuing our exploration of Aristotle's metaphysics, and we're looking at his work called the metaphysics. And in part two here, we are looking at causation and then how form and matter are significant for Aristotle in relationship to causation and nature broadly conceived. So there are four types of causes, according to Aristotle. Causation is very tricky. It's challenging to get a really good grip on causation. Aristotle was one of the first, probably the first person to talk about types of causes. And so for him, the first type of cause is material. So this would include the proper place of the elements, earth, air, water, and fire. This would include, for example, the concentric spheres of Empedocles, the idea, of course, that the earth being at the center, water above that, air above that, fire above that. And how this relates to causation would be the matter of which something is made. So for example, a glass vase that is knocked off a shelf onto a hard surface is going to break. A rubber ball knocked off a high shelf falling on that hard surface is just going to bounce and be fine. So it's the matter that distinguishes what happens, that, that kind of cause. There's also formal cause relating to a thing's form, the nature of the thing. And the nature of a thing includes its shape, but it's not restricted to its shape as we talked about in part one. An efficient cause is a proximate cause. It's that last thing that puts something in motion. It's that last step that changes something. So if, for example, if you had a Rube Goldberg machine where you went through all these steps and then the last step is to swing a hammer and break a glass, it would be that hammer breaking the glass. That action is the efficient cause. Some of the other things preceding that are going to be causes in another sense. So when we're looking at an efficient cause, we're looking at whatever it is that puts something in motion. And finally, there is the final cause, the telos, the end, the goal, or the purpose of the action, that for the sake of which something is done. So depending on which type of cause, what caused this, or why did this happen, those questions might be answered in different ways. Let's take an example from nature, and let's take an example of a rabbit that jumps over a small fence in order to get lettuce. As I've had a garden before where I tried to keep the rabbits out with a fence, I thought it was high enough, but not so much. So the action, the rabbit jumping over the fence, the material clause includes the matter of the rabbit. Rabbits are fairly light. Their bone structure is, is not dense and heavy. And so they're able to jump. Of course, the muscles are made in certain ways so that the legs can jump. That's what we would talk about with a material cause. The formal cause, we're talking about the nature of the rabbit. So there we're talking about what makes a rabbit a rabbit. And one of those things is that it can jump. Another one of those things is that it likes to eat lettuce. And so it's the form of the rabbit, the nature of the rabbit to jump and get to lettuce. And so if we were talking about the formal cause, that's what we would emphasize. Now, the efficient cause is going to be that last thing, the, the jumping itself that causes the rabbit to get into the lettuce. And then the final cause for the rabbit jumping the fence is the purpose, the intention the telos, the goal. The goal is to get to the lettuce. Now, when we're talking about a biological event as we are here, the second, third, and fourth things are all tied together. Because for Aristotle, it's all, all, four, all three of those things are related to the form of a thing. It's the nature of the rabbit that causes it to jump. And so, the, clearly that's a formal cause, but that's also the efficient cause, the rabbit being a rabbit. 
executing its potentiality to jump. And the final cause is related to its nature, the drive to eat lettuce and the ability to jump. For, so in a sense, if we're talking about matter and form for Aristotle, the form is very relevant to the latter three of the types of causes. Now you could also talk about uh, an artifact being made. So this is a chocolate truffle that my wife made. And the material would be the sugar and the cream and the cocoa, those kinds of things that, that make it what it is. The formal cause would include its shape here, you know, being rounded into a ball and then dipped in a, a coating of chocolate. The efficient cause would be that last step, my wife dipping it into the chocolate and putting it on the, the wax paper. And the final cause could be two different things when we're talking about a craft. In one sense, certainly the final cause is to produce a truffle, something that is edible, something that is not merely edible, but something that is enjoyable to eat. At the time, my wife had a business, and so there was also the final cause of selling the truffle in order to make money, to, to bring in some income. And so you could talk about that as the cause. So why did she make the truffle? To make something good to eat is a proper answer, but to make money is also a proper answer. So artifacts obviously don't have the form within themselves that you could relate to all three, second, three, and four types of causes. So you have to look at the artisan, the craftsman, in order to identify those causes when we're talking about an artifact. Now for Aristotle, an omission can also be a cause. An omission occurs when something that is usually causing an effect, like S usually causes E, but then S isn't there. And so that could be a lack that is a cause. So somebody might uh, be asked why they were late for work, and they might say because the bus was late, right? The bus that's normally there to be able to take them to work on time wasn't there. And that lack, that omission, caused the person to be late. So Aristotle gives an example of the incapacitation of the ship captain causing the loss of cargo, or the Exxon Valdez, some 30 plus years ago in 1989, was an oil tanker that hit a, a something in the ocean uh, off the coast of Alaska and then spilled its oil cargo. And it was discovered that the captain who was supposed to be navigating at that time was drinking and put somebody who was not capable of doing it, obviously, in charge. And so he was uh, found guilty and, and made to do community service and charged a lot of money and Exxon was charged a ton of money and so on because there was a lack of control of the ship that's normally there. So omission can be thought of as a cause. Causation might be related to something we would call chance. Now, before we get to that, there are other kinds of events that Aristotle classifies. So there are necessary events. And for Aristotle, in terms of causation, we're merely talking about things that always happen in the same way. So the sun rises in the east, that's a necessary event, it occurs every day. Of course, sometimes it's blocked by clouds, but it occurs every day. Normal events for Aristotle, these are just things that usually happen a certain way. So for example, in Illinois, where I'm from, the August 15th is usually warmer than October 15th. So you could count on, expect that you're going to have warmer weather on August 15th than you are on October 15th. And it would be extremely rare that it's cooler on August 15th than October 15th. So normal events, you can expect them to happen. It's just the way things go. It's, it's a pattern in nature, but you know it might have exceptions. Then there are chance events. Chance events are unusual. They are unusual and they are 
coincidental causes. Now, chance events are for something. Something is fulfilling its nature, but it lacks any intention. There's no intention at all going on. So this would be the case of the classic story, whether fictional or not, of Isaac Newton sitting, on, sitting under a tree and having an apple fall on his head, right? The apple falling from the tree would be something fulfilling its nature. If an apple isn't picked, that's what it does. It falls off the tree, but there wasn't any intention to hit somebody in the head. So that would be a chance event, something that would be unusual and a coincidence. Now, Aristotle distinguishes those from events by luck. And the distinction here, they're both unusual coincidental events. They're both not normal and they are by coincidence, but in, and they are for something because as we'll mention in a, mo in a moment, everything is for something in nature for Aristotle. Uh, but events by luck actually involve purposeful intended action. It's just that the event that we're talking about wasn't the action intended. So Aristotle gives this as an example. Suppose um, Al owes Bob $50 and Al goes to the market to buy some bread and Bob happens to go to the market at the same time to buy a melon and uh, Bob sees Al and says, hey, you got the $50 and Al has it, so he pays his debt, right? So the fact that they are there at the same time is a coincidence. They are both there for a purpose. They are the, making intentional actions, but Al didn't go in order to pay the debt and Bob didn't go in order to get the debt paid. And so that distinguishes events by luck from events by chance. Now let's talk a little bit about nature. For Aristotle, nature is goal-directed. It is teleological, telos, goal, an end. There is a purpose in what is going on in nature. And we could talk about a conditional necessity for biological entity. So nature through its biological entities are acting out of conditional necessity. So for example, in order to eat meat, some animals have teeth in a certain shape and position. So certainly sharks have a certain shape of teeth that are very useful for ripping and tearing meat. Likewise with dogs. And obviously sharks and dogs thrive on eating meat. And so in order to eat meat, nature has provided these animals through a conditional necessity. It's conditional because they didn't have to have them. Aristotle doesn't think nature works that way with biological entities, but it's necessary in the sense of in order to eat meat, if they're going to eat meat, they need that kind of teeth. And so since they are meat eaters, the kinds of animals that need meat, they have that kind of teeth. And the structure of the teeth can't be explained by chance, and it's not just pure necessity. So this is a distinction from Empedocles, for example, who thought that just, you know, body parts were created just kind of by chance, and then they happened to fit together with other body parts to form animals in certain ways and it's all by chance and you get these misshaped animals and, and all kinds of funny stuff going on with Empedocles. But uh, Aristotle doesn't view it that way. Aristotle does see nature as being teleological and goal-directed. So let's think about this a little bit more and compare this to art. So just as a craftsman or an artisan has a goal when they're producing an artifact. So a blacksmith has a goal of producing an ax. Uh, so does nature, right? Uh, nature also has a goal. So like a home builder has a goal is building a home. Similar, similarly, right, a bird has a goal when it builds its nest. There is a purpose behind the activity. 
obviously there is a slight difference here, right? The similarity is not that they're both directed by intelligence. In this case, the home builder is directed by intelligence. Think through the various things that are going on, why they're going to be there, what materials are useful. There is an intelligence behind it. That's not the case with a bird for Aristotle. In fact, plants could be used in this illustration for roots going into the ground and leaves developing on its branches. So uh, that also is goal oriented, right? That the similarity here is that both of these kinds of activities are directed toward an end or a goal. So Aristotle says biological entities are primary examples of substances that exist, are goal directed, and there is a purpose behind their activity. Now, just like a craftsman could make a mistake, mistakes could occur in nature. So uh, just like a home builder may not uh, build, a, a put doors on in the right way so that the breeze comes through the door or something like that. And in nature that might occur. So for example, a, a horse born with deformed legs so that it can't fulfill its nature of running around. And so this is a goal that is missed, both with the craftsman, but for Aristotle, importantly, for the horse. It's a goal that is missed, an intention, a purpose. I shouldn't say intention here, I'm sorry. You don't wanna think of intelligence here. He's not, say, he's not talking about intelligent design, things like that, but it is purposeful. There is a purpose behind it. And nature is related to form. So as we saw in the physics, the form is a thing's nature rather than the matter. So we talked about a bed, for example, if you wanna talk about the nature of the bed, which is made of wood, you don't talk about the wood, you talk about the form, its, its structure and its shape for a, a, a craft, an article. So in nature, it's the form that must be the cause in the sense of that for the sake of which. That's why the formal cause in nature is the same as the final cause, the purpose for the action. Now, let's take this as an example of an artifact, so to speak, that occurs in nature. The final cause of the spider's web, it comes of course from the form of the spider, but the web itself has a form. So the final cause of the spider's web is the form of the web. We could talk about it that way. And here, of course, we're, we're kind of mixing nature and artifacts, right? Just like we did with the bird and the nest. Nature is purposeful. It has a cause and the form of a spider web is such that the spider can walk on it safely by walking on the parts of the web that are going inward and outward towards the circles. The circular parts, as I recall, are the sticky parts that the insects get caught in. And so the spider's web is made with that purpose so that the spider can walk on it safely but insects cannot so the spider can catch food and the final cause of the biological activity of the spider making its web is the form so we can talk both about the form of the spider it's in the spider's nature to make a web and we can also talk about the form of the web it has that shape and purpose right it is intended designed, if you like, as long as we keep in mind that doesn't mean intelligence, in order to catch flies or other insects for the spider to eat. So that's causation for Aristotle. In part three, we're going to look on, on what he has to say about the infinite.